1915, a passenger ferry, heavily loaded with excited travellers, sank in an entirely preventable manner because owners had put profits over the lives of their passengers. It was a global news story that should have ensured that it never happened again. But then, almost 100 years later in 2014, a passenger ferry, heavily loaded with excited travellers, sank in an entirely preventable manner because owners had put profit over the lives of their passengers. It was a global news story that should ensure it will never happen again. The ocean is an undoubtedly dangerous place. Sometimes disasters at sea can happen seemingly out of the blue. Storms raging beyond human control have wrecked and ruined countless ships. At other times, warfare has seen some terrible tragedies unfold. But some of the most frustrating cases of loss of life have been entirely preventable. Bureaucracy, bad business practices, companies that have put the mighty dollar over the value of human lives. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs, and this is the story of two disasters separated by 100 years. The SS Eastland and the MV Seawall. A harsh lesson on what happens when you ignore history. If you were strolling along the Chicago River in July 1915, you'd have been met with a strange, tragic sight. An excursion ferry, totally on its side, alongside its dock, with dozens of people frantically working on the overturned hull, trying to free those trapped inside. Hundreds were dead, but pathetically, the awful chain of events that led to the sinking of this ship were completely avoidable. The Great Lakes are like an immense series of inland seas, providing a vital waterway to link major cities like Chicago, Buffalo, Michigan, Detroit, Milwaukee, Cleveland, and more. The SS Eastland was a passenger ship designed for the lakes. Known as the Great Lakes Speed Queen, she was launched in 1903. For decades, there'd been a bustling passenger trade across the lakes, so countless ferries and steamers were built to capitalize on the demand, operating voyages to link railheads, and stop at towns and cities along the way. Aside from operating a regular timetable, ferries could be chartered for events and functions as pleasure cruises and day trips became more popular. The SS Eastland's design and construction was a little unorthodox, and the seeds for the disaster that would occur over 10 years later were sown from the start. The contract for the ship's construction was awarded to the Jenks Shipbuilding Company of Michigan. Now, the shipyard had a history of building freighters and tugboats, and Eastland would be their first and only passenger ship project. Sidney Jenks, the yard's chief designer, consulted with his naval architecture professor from Cornell University on the project, and the pair came up with the outline for their ship. It had a dual purpose, a cargo vessel and a passenger ferry, and it needed to maintain a good turn of speed to keep up the demanding schedule. Capacity for passengers needed to be 500 for overnight voyages, housed comfortably in cabins. But critically, Eastland needed a shallow draft, that is the amount of ship that's below the waterline, to allow it to enter into those shallow ports. The design was finalised, and calculations on the ship's metacentric height and centre of gravity were completed. Now, these all dictate the stability of the ship's final design. But then, the shipyard Jenx, probably at the request of the steamship's future owners, shortened the length by 60 feet and added a passenger deck. Now, this would obviously have a huge impact on the calculations on balance and stability, but apparently no recalculating was done and no further inclining tests on the ship's stability were carried out. The result was a long, thin, tall ship with a design top speed of 20 knots and some quirky habits. Now, from the beginning, Eastland was known to be top heavy and had a history of stability issues. She would roll this way and that, and something passengers found funny as the steamer limped into or out of port. It meant for the captain and his engineers, operating the ship was a never-ending game of pumping water into and out of ballast tanks to straighten the ship up. Now, this instability was primarily due to Eastland's relatively narrow beam, or the ship's width, in comparison to its length and height. It made it prone to listing from side to side. The narrow beam was a reflection on Eastland's purpose, speed and efficiency. The beam was one thing, but even more alarming was Eastland's shallow draft. To compensate for a high centre of gravity, designers can give the ship more draft, that's simply more of it under the waterline to ensure stability. 
Back then, designers of the age set about 60% of the hull below the waterline. But this created more drag, and the engines had to work harder. Now, Eastland's draft was already shallow, far less than the usual 60%, but after her inaugural season in 1903, the ship's draft was reduced even further in an effort to gain even more speed. The ship was built for efficiency. As an engineer later put it, the idea was to save coal by keeping the hull as much out of the water as possible. The draft was cut in two. Instead of 60%, only 30% of Eastland's hull could be found below the waterline. Now, the 1903 to 1904 refit reduced the ship's draft and added even more weight above the waterline. Worst of all, Eastland was regularly sailing with well over 2,000 passengers. Measures were taken to try to fix the ship's bad behaviour. The ship's passenger complement was lowered by 200, and some staterooms were taken out. Then, a couple of years later, the remaining cabins were removed because they sat way too high up in the hull, and the funnels were cut down in height. Two tons of concrete were added lower down to try to balance things out, but still, when loading passengers, the ship was known to dip down in the water by as much as 25 degrees. In August 1913, naval engineer John Devereux York took a voyage on Eastland and was appalled by what he saw. He said, in trying to make the harbour, it was like steering a log of wood. She wouldn't obey the helm. He quickly wrote a letter to the US harbour master of the city's port saying, You are aware of the condition of the SS Eastland, and unless structural defects are remedied to prevent listing, there may be a serious accident. But he got no response. Now that was already bad enough, but then things got even worse. In response to the Titanic disaster in 1912, new maritime safety regulations were enacted, requiring ships to carry enough lifeboats and rafts for all passengers. For the Eastland, this meant adding additional lifeboats, which would be shipped on the top weather deck. This added tons of weight to the uppermost part of the ship. Now obviously this couldn't go unnoticed, as the already unstable Eastland was renowned for its funny tendency to roll to one side. A. A. Chance, general manager of the Detroit and Cleveland Navigation Company, petitioned hard against this change because, as a ferry operator himself, he knew the danger. Eastland was not a unique case. Many of the Great Lakes ships were designed and built in a similar way. If their upper decks were crowded with lifeboats, they were likely to capsize if the conditions were right. He told Congress, the extra weight of the lifeboats and rafts would make ships of the Great Lakes top-heavy and unseaworthy, and some of them would turn turtle if you attempted to navigate them with this additional weight on the upper decks. Eastland's owners and operators, the St. Joseph Chicago Steamship Company, complained about the change as well, with the general manager writing to the Secretary of Commerce in Washington and saying, if it were possible to put this amount of equipment on the Eastland, the weight that would be added to its upper deck would make the boat difficult to handle. Now this all sounds very noble on behalf of Eastland's owners, but now they had a choice to make. With an unmoved government, they could prove that passenger safety was truly at the heart of their complaints by operating Eastland with fewer lifeboats, but a reduced passenger capacity. Now, fewer passengers meant, of course, lower revenue. Or they could accept the danger, fit more lifeboats, and apply for a permit to raise passenger capacity and earn more revenue. Now, Eastland's owners, of course, chose the latter. Increased revenue at the expense of their passengers' safety. On the morning of July 24th, at 6.30am Eastland, docked at the Clark Street Bridge, began to take on passengers. The day was planned for a Western Electric Company picnic across Lake Michigan from Chicago to Michigan City, Indiana. Excitement was high, and families arrived early to secure a spot on the ship. But at 7am, Eastland began to show signs of instability. As passengers continued to board, Eastland started to list slightly to starboard indicating the early signs of imbalance. The open gangway doors dropped lower into the water, to within just 18 inches, or 45 centimetres. The ship's chief engineer, Ericsson, ordered the two port side ballast tanks flooded to correct the issue. Now this was standard for the Eastland at the time. Just 10 minutes later, passenger capacity was reached, and the ship began to list to port up to 15 degrees. Now this could be attributed to a number of things. For one, around three quarters of the ship's coal had been incorrectly trimmed and loaded into the port side alone. By flooding the port side ballast tanks, Ericsson was only adding to the improper loading. But even worse, Eastland was probably over passenger capacity. She'd been licensed to carry about 2,570 people, but eyewitnesses suggest there were many more aboard. 
At 7.15am, more corrective actions were attempted. To counteract the new port list, crew members attempted to adjust the ballast by adding water to the tanks on the starboard side of the ship. Now Eastland straightened up, but only for a few short minutes. Passengers were largely unaware of the growing instability, and those that were seemed to just laugh it off as another peculiar quirk of the ship. Five minutes later at 7.20am, Eastland had finished loading, and preparations were being made for departure, but the port list was worsening. Passengers were ordered to move to the starboard side, because alarmingly, water had begun to flood into the open port side gangway doors, which were now within reach of the river. Eastland's captain continued the departure though, and the ship's stern began to swing away from the dock. Now this, and the ship's band, which continued to play, tricked passengers into thinking that all was well, and they began to move away from the starboard side railing to watch the departure. At around 7.27am, the ship listed to port up to 30 degrees. Water was now roaring through the gangway doors down into the bottom of the ship, causing crew members from down in the machinery spaces to panic and rush up their escape ladders. Crew up top began moving passengers to the starboard side again, but with much greater difficulty because the weather decks were now wet and slippery from the light rain. Just seconds later, Eastland listed sharply to port up to 45 degrees. Now this time the list was so severe that it had become clear the ship was in grave danger of fully capsizing. The piano and the large main refrigerator broke free and fell away to the port side, crushing some passengers. And inside the ship, dishes and glasses smashed off of tables. Passengers and crew scrambled to the main staircase to escape, but it caused a lethal bottleneck and hardly anyone could get through. At around 7.30am, the inevitable happened and Eastland capsized. In a matter of seconds, the ship had rolled completely over onto its port side, trapping hundreds of passengers inside and throwing many into the Chicago River. The sight was absolutely bizarre because with seemingly no warning, no fire or explosion, no dramatic collision or shouts of panic, the ship seemed to simply tip over before the eyes of hundreds of observers at the dockside or from nearby office buildings. Writer Jack Woodford saw it happen and he wrote, I watched in disoriented stupefaction a steamer large as an ocean liner slowly turned over on its side as though it were a whale going to take a nap. I didn't believe a huge steamer had done this before my eyes, lashed to a dock, in perfectly calm water in excellent weather, with no explosion, no fire, nothing. I thought I'd gone crazy. Because Eastland had sunk at her dock, the response was almost instant with dozens crowding the ship's hull, attempting to haul survivors out. Bystanders, emergency personnel and other vessels in the area rushed to the aid of victims. The rescue operation was chaotic and heartrending, with rescuers breaking windows to pull people from the submerged hull and divers searching the murky waters for survivors. The result of the sinking was horrific. 844 passengers and crew killed, in fact more passengers died on Eastland than had died on Titanic three years prior. Inside the ship, divers got to work but they soon realised their mission had become one of body recovery. The interior was shockingly confusing and disorienting with everything now rotated 90 degrees. Dozens and dozens of bodies were found jammed in the bottleneck that had formed at the main staircase leading out of the hull. Now the news was a sensation, and even as bodies were being pulled out of the overturned hull, newspapers ran sordid headlines and indicted owners and shipbuilders alike. Engineer John Devereux York, who had written that letter in 1913 to the Chicago Harbour Master warning of impending disaster, passed his letter on to the local media, furthering the outrage. Of course, the resulting scandal caused furious, justified questions from the outraged public. How could this have happened when Eastland's design was well known to have been dangerous? Why did the owners operate the ship, and how were they allowed to have operated it at all? Questioning began with Jenks, the designers and builders of the ship. Now it soon became clear that standards of shipbuilding on the lakes had been lax. Sidney Jenks, Eastland's designer, testified that his vessel had only been designed for 500 passengers for the original owners. He said, I had no way of knowing the quantity of its business after it left our yards. Now damningly, no inclining test on the ship's stability was ever performed. He said that because the ship had been launched on its side, lent over 45 degrees, and then righted itself again, that it had demonstrated its stability just fine, and that was apparently enough. With six members of the St. Joseph Chicago Steamship Company indicted for conspiracy and negligence, 
Judge Clarence Sessions said that there is no proof which tends, even to a slight degree, to fasten such guilt upon any of the respondents. Every act charged and proved against these respondents was done in the usual and ordinary course of business. In fact, the company's knowledge of Eastland's bad past behaviour seems embarrassingly basic. Back in 1913, during discussions around the sale, no mention of the instability was ever made, nor the major listing incidents from early in the ship's career. At an inquest, Walter C. Steele, the company's secretary treasurer, said, I didn't know much about the boat except that we had got it at a bargain. All I do is to sign blank checks. So what had happened? Well, in brief, the government had ordered the installation of additional lifeboats if the company had wished to maintain the massive passenger capacity, something Eastland's original builder later testified she'd never been designed for in the first place. In retrospect, we know that Eastland's owners had complained about their ship seaworthiness with additional lifeboats fitted, but clearly, in opting to fit additional lifeboats to boost passenger capacity, they had chosen profit over safety. In the event, when Eastland rolled over, the lifeboats were basically useless and more of a hazard than anything else. Many of the St. Joseph Chicago Steamship Company executives had avoided extradition to Illinois, staying in Michigan instead to avoid federal charges, and their extradition was barred by the same judge who had said that every act charged and proved against those respondents was done in the, quote, usual and ordinary course of business. If they truly had no knowledge of their ship's strange behaviours and top heaviness, then surely they need only have looked at the thing as it pathetically limped and listed 10, 15 degrees from side to side, or even read reports from engineers who were tasked with furiously pumping water in and out of tanks to maintain balance. If they were truly concerned for passenger safety, thanks to the additional lifeboats as they had stated earlier, then surely they should have conducted stability and inclination tests on their ship with the lifeboats fitted, but they never did. Now, if not guilty of deliberate manslaughter, then surely Eastland's owners and operators were guilty of extreme incompetence and negligence, but they were never found guilty and escaped unscathed. Unforgivably, they blamed Eastland's chief engineer Ericsson for the disaster and maintained that his counter-flooding of the ballast tanks and attempting to mitigate the listing was the cause of the accident. Cases dragged on and on for two decades, in 1919, Ericsson, the chief engineer, had died, and he became an easy scapegoat for the disaster. In 1933, the matter was closed at a limitation of liability hearings that concluded, astoundingly, that Ericsson's mishandling of the ballast tanks was the cause of the disaster, and the Eastland was, quote, on the morning of July 24, 1915, seaworthy in every respect, fit for the carriage of passengers, if properly handled. There was no watershed reform of maritime safety, in fact, there was no regulatory result at all. Eastland and her 844 victims slipped from the headlines and slowly faded from memory, while the St. Joseph Chicago Steamship Company and its owners and officers escaped scot-free. Now, This infamous disaster didn't result in any major precedent of law, although it darn well should have. The Eastland sinking serves as a tragic reminder of what happens when businesses are allowed, unchecked and unregulated to maintain unsafe standards of practice. So you can only feel intense frustration when those valuable lessons are ignored and history repeats itself because as it would happen almost 100 years after Eastland's sinking, another ferry operator would bumble into a similar lethal disaster by ignoring history. MV Sewol was a passenger and car ferry bought by Chung Hai Jin Marine in 2012 from its original Japanese operators. And by then, Sewol had had a nearly two decade long career without incident, but at the time of sale, the ship was tired after hard use. Now the new owners set about sprucing her up to introduce her on the popular Incheon to Jeju route, but rather than just give the old ship a new lick of paint, the new owners sought to totally overhaul her to maximize passenger capacity and profit. They added extra passenger cabins and an art gallery towards the top of the ship, which added capacity for 116 more passengers, increasing the ship's size by 239 tons. Now, obviously, modifications to this extent can change the behaviour and stability of a ship of Sewol's size. In fact, the vessel's centre of gravity was found to have moved by 1 foot 8 inches, or about half a metre higher. Now, things have changed somewhat since Eastland's day. Modifications can't just be made and go untested. Sewol needed a certification of seaworthiness, so inclining and stability tests were undertaken by the Korean Register of Shipping. 
they found that yes, Sewell's stability had changed, but not so much that the ship was unseaworthy. Instead, the operators needed to change the way they handled their ship. Sewell would need to take on far less cargo, 553 tons less to be exact, and the ship needed about 400 tons more ballast to provide the necessary stability. With that, Sewell got her certificate and the modifications were approved. But the ferry's operator was already playing with fire, because as it turns out, the Korean Register of Shipping had been given falsified documents. These underrepresented Sewell's total light weight by 100 tons, as well as drastically reducing the cargo weight. Now the incline test was done based off of this figure. A subsequent report found that, quote, if the inclining test had been done on the basis of the correct data, the Sewell's remodeling could not have been approved. That wasn't all. Chong Hai Jin Marine added more than 30 tons of marble to the new gallery, well after the inspections and approval had been given and all that additional weight was never factored into the Korean Register of Shipping's decision making. Sewell got to work on the Incheon to Jeju route, but soon the ship was found to be, unsurprisingly, unstable. Crew members noticed the ship's desire to list, and dock workers found that during loading and unloading, the ship would lurch dangerously from one side to the other. Now if this is sounding suspiciously similar to the story of SS Eastland, then you'd be infinitely more astute than Sewell's owners because Chong Hai Jin Marine ignored these reports and never got back to any of the crew who complained. Sewell was regularly operated, overloaded, and underballasted. The requirements that the registry had set to approve the ship's remodeling in the first place were totally ignored. One of Sewell's captains made complaint after complaint about the ship's bad handling, and the company responded by threatening to fire him. On April 15th, 2014, the ferry was taking on passengers for its regular service to Jeju, and within hours, it would be sunk. Sewell's cargo was loaded aboard, including dozens of cars. She'd been limited to 1,077 tons, but that day she shipped over 2,200 tons of cargo. To make up for the overloading, Sewell's ballast, which was supposed to sit at 2,400 tons, was instead as little as 1,042 tons, only 43% of the required amount. Now this unsafe loading condition should have been caught by inspectors before the ship departed, but they only visually sighted the loading line on the hull. Now this comprises of a series of marks that show how deep the ship is sitting in the water. If it's overloaded with cargo, it will be clearly sitting too deep. But because the crew had compensated by emptying some of the ballast tanks, the ship was sitting right where it should be, and no alarm was raised. Now the stage was set for a disaster of terrible magnitude, as the ferry pulled away from the dock with 466 passengers and crew aboard, including 325 students from a high school on the way to a field trip. Sure enough, Sewol set out as it had done hundreds of times for Jeju, and all seemed well until, at around 8.46 in the morning of April 16th, the ship underwent a course change. The resulting series of turns and a supposed steering failure put the ship hard over in the water, executing a 15 degree turn for about 40 seconds. Now for a normal ship, this would be an easy task, but for the dangerously overloaded and underballasted Sewol, it was fatal. As the ship turned, it began to list. Now normally, a ship's restoring force would see it resume equilibrium after such a turn, but Sewol was in bad shape. Not only had the overloaded cargo badly hampered the restoring force, but something even more nefarious was at play. All those tons and tons of overloaded cargo were meant to be securely lashed in place, but Shanghai Jin had outsourced the job to a private unlicensed company. The ship's own crew didn't even know how to operate the lashings properly, and sure enough, that cargo came largely loose. As Sewol turned, crates and boxes began to slide across the cargo decks and gather up against bulkheads and the hull on the port side. Sewol's restoring force was completely destroyed, and now, with more cargo beginning to stack up, a deadly domino effect was put into place. By 8.50am, Sewol was listing 30 degrees onto her port side. A few curious passengers made their way topside, but the vessel's intercom system began to repeat instructions to the effect of do not move, stay where you are, and the majority of passengers stayed in their cabins. Students from the high school began to stream the events from their phones and laugh it off, referring to the movie Titanic. But incredibly, as the ship's captain and officers conferred on the bridge about what to do, 
the first actual emergency call was made by a high school student, Choi Duk Ha, who did not survive the disaster. Sewol listed far onto her port side and began to flood. By 1025, she was over by 90 degrees, completely capsized and sinking. An hour later, the ship was almost totally gone with just the tip of her bulbous bow peeking out from the surface of the ocean and there were only 172 survivors. This tragic series of events did not go unpunished, unlike the Eastland disaster from a century before. The ship's captain and crew, whose responsibility it had been to actually ensure Sewell was fit to operate safely, were prosecuted and the possibility of the death sentence was even floated. But in the end, the ship's captain got a life sentence, the chief engineer got 10 years and 13 others were imprisoned as well. But as we know, the origins of the Sewell disaster lay largely with her owners, Chong Hai Jin. They had lied from the start, presenting false documents, illegally modifying their ship and exhibiting unbelievable carelessness in operating their ferry. It's a miracle that the Sewol didn't sink earlier, but incredibly, the sentencing for the executives was far more lenient than the ship's crew. In fact, the company's chief executive officer got a 10-year sentence for the cargo's overloading. The company's license to operate ferries was cancelled a month after the disaster, and Chong Hai Jin Marine was defunct. Lessons in safety are written in blood and human lives. Regulations and rules exist, especially as far as maritime safety goes, for good reasons. Through the hundreds and hundreds of years that humans have sailed the oceans, we've learned a lot about the way you should build and operate a ship. So when owners and businessmen try to circumvent those lessons and laws for their own personal profit, it should be no surprise when things go wrong. What is more of a surprise, then, is the fact that they seem to get away with it. Yes, Eastland and Sewell's captains and engineers should have ensured that their ships were ready for the task at hand, but when the owners are as deceitful as those of Sewell, or as wantonly uninformed as those of Eastland, then safely operating a ship becomes all the more difficult for the skipper and the crew. In 1915, the SS Eastland taught us valuable lessons about how to safely operate ferries, lessons that were ignored by the ferry Sewell's owners 100 years later. Now the lessons from the sinking of Sewa will have to stand as a testament to safety at sea, and only time will tell if we take those lessons truly to heart.